before we get um, talking about some of the details of Matthew chapter 2, there, there was a time where, if I had to admit, I was, I was kind of waiting for the Lord actually not to come right back. I wanted to do a couple things. And part of that was back in 2008, I wanted to go ahead and I wanted to be married. I had been, I had a long distance relationship with Stephanie, and we got engaged, and in six months we were kind of, kind of far apart. I was in Oregon, she was in Dallas, Texas, and she was kind of planning the wedding, and she was every once in a while asking me, is this okay? I'm like, okay, okay sure, no problem. And, and there was a couple things I said, no, let's do it this way. But, for more than six months I was excited to be married. I had a plane flight that was leaving Coos Bay, which was about an hour and 44 minutes away. I woke up early. It was early morning. I looked at the clock and I said, I have plenty of time. So I got up. I made breakfast. I showered. Did all the little details. I'm like, oh, I need to stop by the post office. I'm going to be gone for a while. And so I'm sure I even watched the news and stuff like that I was, as I was getting ready thinking I had tons of time. I ended up going ahead, getting in my car, and dropping by the post office before I would head out to the airport. Got to the airport, kind of realized it was maybe I was running a little late. Then I looked at the clock. I realized it just takes a little bit over an hour, well, an hour and 40 minutes, and it was, it was a little bit under an hour that I had to get to that airport. So, driving on 101, I think I tried to be as fast as I could go, but as safe as I could be with the fog and everything else in that February morning, driving through, praying that no elk would jump in front of me or deer would cross the road, and praying that I wouldn't get behind any slow car because something I was so excited about, something I was just anticipating, I had messed up. I, had, I had thought it was good, but the time got away from me. And I can remember just driving to the airport as fast as I could. And if you're not familiar with Coos Bay Airport, they, they've actually had, had recently, it opened right before then, a new one. It's not a very big one. So, in that, I hope that somehow, some way, some manner, I would be able to get on that plane. I pulled into the parking lot, heart racing, and I looked at the clock. The clock was the time I was to be boarding. Now, I ran up as fast as I could. I, I had a bag, and I ran up to the counter. As I was going, getting up to the counter, there was this person, uh, an attendant, talking to another gentleman that was saying, well, your last name is Trip, but maybe they got it wrong here. There's a Brian Trip. Maybe there's something, some confusion with the, the flight here. And I said, no, I'm Brian Tripp. And I hold in my ticket as like that would give me entry in right away. Of course, there's nothing like air support security and everything else. And by this time, I had missed the actual departure time. So, was I going to get on or not? I had this thing that I had been waiting for and pins and needles, waiting and wanting to be married, and here I am, almost going to miss the flight. Well, let us go ahead and look in the book of Matthew. Now, if you're, if you're not there, I know all of you are waiting, did I actually make it or not? I'll tell you in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, turn in the books to Matthew uh, 2, 1 through 12. 
And it starts off this way. In fact, this is a familiar story, but I think doing it at a time where it's not exactly that the season and everything else can actually shine a little bit different light on it because this is a story for all times that really proclaims the coming of Jesus. And what we have to remember is last week we we talked, we had gone through first the lineage of Jesus saying, yes, um, he was of the line of David. He was uh, a descendant of Abraham. And not only that, that Mary was given a word and, and, and Joseph had come along and we'd seen that, that Jesus was completely God, completely man and now it kind of jumps, we can fill in some of the holes with the gospel of Luke but here it comes about the king and, and, and the telling of all that would come and worship him and here we are in Matthew 2 verse 1. But the thing that I want you to keep in mind is that we do not want to miss out on the worship of the king. That the king is the one who we want to worship. And throughout this story, we will see that there are individuals who go ahead and they miss the thing that they had been anticipating, the thing that they had been wanting. They miss out on it. So, here we are. It starts off this way. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came uh, east to uh, Jerusalem, saying, we are he, or Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it arose, and have come to worship him. And the very first of it, we are introduced into some characters. Now, King Herod was king of that time, and as he was king of that time, he did not want to lose out on being king. So, in fact, he was very jealous of his throne and didn't want anything to get in the way of that. And so, he even killed and murdered some of his own family members just to be able to keep his position as king. And as we see, he... It says he was born in Bethlehem, and, and we can, can know that from the Gospel of Luke that he got there because there was a census that was required to be given. And as that census was given, God was able to rearrange all of that area just to make sure that Jesus was there in the place that had been prophesied. And so Jesus comes to the place, and then Herod is there, and he doesn't want to lose his position. And it says, Behold, wise men came uh, from the east. And what we understand about um, this, and and some translations might say magi, these wise men, uh, and since magis were either, whether they were kind of magicians or they were uh, astrologers, they would go ahead and they were looking and trying to find wisdom, looking at all sorts of different things. We don't know much about them. It doesn't say that they're kings. It doesn't say that there's three of them. It just kind of says that they're there. And as we know throughout Scripture, even, even in, uh, throughout the Old Testament, that they weren't looked upon very well within Old Testament Scripture. In fact, even in the book of Jeremiah, it said, hey, don't follow after them. And then it also says that these men were coming from the east. So we don't know exactly where they may have been. They may have been um, from the area of uh, the Babylonian area. They might have even had some of the writings that Daniel had gone ahead and had when they were held in captivity there. But one of the things that we had seen is it's, it's kind of quoting from Numbers 20, 24, 17. And in number 24, 17, it says this, I see him, not now, I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It is, uh, shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Seth. And so what we see is, this is a passage in the book of Numbers that is given by uh, Balaam to go ahead and to kind of talk about one that would come and that would deliver and it is seen as a messiah uh, prophecy that would come. Now, if, if you're not Balaam, probably most of us know about Balaam in the sense of the donkey and he wanted the donkey to move and then the donkey 
spoke, but there's a little bit more to that. See, what happened was Israel was supposed to go into battle. And, and as they were, didn't go into the battle that Lord, the Lord had called them to do, they were going to go up through Moab. And the king Balak of Moab said, all right, I don't want to fight these Israelites in a uh, conventional way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hire an individual who is a, in a sense, a uh, prophet that could speak words that would come true. And so he goes ahead and hires Balaam. Now, Balaam kind of probably studied all sorts of different religions and all sorts of things. But in one sense, uh, from probably tradition and history, what he had said would come true. And so, Balak said, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to speak curses against Israel. And as, as he went ahead and went before the Lord, and the Lord wouldn't allow him to do that. And so, in that, he, he would only be able to speak praises uh, about the Lord and, and his goodness. And so, in that, we kind of even can go ahead and kind of overlay a little bit with the, uh, with the wise men and just say, all right, these wise men, as we'll see, are told by a king that doesn't want to lose power to go out and to gather information and to do something. Now, obviously, the story is kind of uh, split ways. But it's interesting that God uses people that are not necessarily Christ's followers to accomplish his will and to bring about his purpose. Now, even with Balaam, we'll see that in, in the book of, of Numbers and, and throughout, he actually ends up going ahead and can't speak bad, but he ends up getting the Israelite men to go ahead and to follow false gods. So God, and in, in that I say that he in him of himself was not a believer in Yahweh, a believer in the Old Testament scripture, but God still used him and he still chose to divert and to go his way. And you can see in, in Second Peter and also in the book of Revelation that it, it, he's given the title of one that deceived Israel in his way of wandering and not doing that, even though the Lord would not allow him to speak evil against the Israelites and to proclaim uh, their loss in battle. And so, just kind of a background as, we, as, he, as he goes ahead, and that's kind of one of those quotes that starts talking about, all right, let's just explain that there's something that's going to come, and it's going to come out of the East, and, 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 and it's talking about that. So I, I think it's interesting just to see the contrast with Balaam and, and, and these wise men. And as they're coming, and this is what it says, and it talks about that... Uh, the question that he asked in, in verse 2, it says, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? All right. So that question, that, that title, is already being given to Jesus. Now, there are probably those that are going to be the president of the United States one day that are alive. Unless the Lord returns, they're there here. Do you know of anybody that's going out and looking for them? No. I don't think somebody's going up to all the different two-year-olds and three-year-olds. You know, if you, if you go up to all of them, I mean, half of them might say, yeah, I'm going to be president, not really knowing what that is. But we don't have that going on. But So there's something unique, something special that's going on. And Herod is in such great fear that he is even willing to kill a whole mass of children in order to keep his position on that throne. And so the response and the knowledge of what's going to happen just terrifies him and he wants to rebel about this news of this king that is coming. And, and so they, and what we see is these wise men have, arose and they saw a star and to worship him. And then it says in verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he, um, he was uh, troubled. And, so, and not only was he troubled, all of Jerusalem with him. Huh. So, it, just, just play this out with me. Here is a king who is afraid of a birth of the king that 
is going to be king that, that is eternal, everlasting, that there will never be, his kingdom will never be overthrown. As we look at scripture and we think about it, who allowed Herod to be king in the first place? God. So something that he didn't even have the right or the claim to, he was all worried about losing, even though God himself had allowed him to be in that position for his purpose, for his glory. And he is all concerned about this baby that would be born. How can I control this situation where he absolutely really has no control in? And so he is troubled. All of Jerusalem is troubled with him. And in that, it says, and assuming, uh, and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he inquired of them uh, the Christ that was to be born. And so what we see is when it talks about the chief priests and the the uh, scribes, these represent two different groups. And the chief priests are representing the Jewish worshipers, and the scribes are representing those who know the law. Those that would know who Jesus is in in the scriptures that he was going to be born and where he was going to be born and when it was supposed to happen. So those that, that knew it, and it doesn't say, and they hesitated and they waited, they said, no, we know that he is going to be born in Bethlehem. We see that they do nothing. They do absolutely nothing. Now, if I knew something big was going to happen, what would I do? I'd try to find out more information about it. I would do what I could. In fact, you see in the news and the media that even through political stuff in the United States, people will go, all right, what's going on? And they'll turn on their TV and they'll listen and they'll watch with great anticipation what's going to happen. And what bigger news is this? That Jesus would be born, a king would be born to end all other kingdoms. One that would sustain, one that would be everlasting. And those that knew it did nothing. Now, we can look at that and we can go, what's going on here? Shouldn't they be motivated? I mean, we can look at the, the, the Magi or, or the wise men, and, and they were motivated to get up and to travel over long distances to come see this. But those who knew this was going to happen, they were unmotivated. They didn't do anything. They just said, well, well, and then, and then they'll go ahead and they'll quote some, some scripture saying, yes, I do know what's going to happen. But they themselves couldn't get up and travel about six miles to go see what was going over in Bethlehem. But what about ourselves? I mean, think about it. What truths do we know about Jesus? We know that he died on the cross and then he rose again. And, and in him, we, since we, I assume that we're, a number of us are believers in here, that he died on the cross for us. And and if we believe that, we also believe he's returning again. We just, during communion, just talked about that quite a bit. The Lord is returning. And we know that the only way for somebody to, to know Jesus is as we proclaim his name and present the gospel that God uses that to draw people to himself. And so we have all of this in Scripture And whether I ask you or pastors across the United States and throughout the world, ask their congregation and go, how many people did you witness to this past week about the great news that the Lord is going to return? You'd have few and far between people raising their hands. Yes, they believe it. They know it's true. But how does it translate We're given scripture. And at the very end of the sermon, I'll I'll kind of even show you kind of the main scripture that talks about that. But we know these truths are in scripture. And maybe we're even feeling a little guilty right now. 
But does that translate into life action moving? Does that translate into going, this is the greatest news in the world. I am so joyful about it. I'm so excited about it that I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk to whoever I can. And, and I don't know who it is, so I'm going to pray. And, and I want people to come to me. I'm, I'm going to go out. I'm going to do whatever I can. That should be my focus in life, knowing that I am a living sacrifice to God. I have been bought. But what happens is, we oftentimes go, yeah. I know Jesus. Almost in the same way we know people on Facebook. Isn't that interesting? Now, you're friends with people on Facebook. Has anybody ever Facebook stalked somebody? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm raising my hand. When I say Facebook stalk somebody, I mean like you go ahead and you click on their photos, you click on their feed and you look back and you know exactly what they've done for the last seven or ten years of their lives because whatever they put on Facebook, you don't really know them. You might know about them, but you don't have any real maybe connections with them. Maybe you knew them in high school. Maybe you, you knew them from somewhere else and, and that's all you know of them, but yet you could get in a conversation with somebody and go, and go hey, remember so-and-so? And you go, oh yeah, they're doing this and this and last year they went on vacation and they went to Disney World and, and they're having such a great time. But do you really know them? No. So what happens, what translates is we, we, we get into these relationships and we say, all right, that's a good enough relationship. But when we look at Scripture, Jesus clearly says, all right, you have a relationship with me? It doesn't mean that you just sit back and wait. It means that you're fully engaged and you're waiting for my return and you know the consequences of those who don't trust in me and you don't want that for anybody. So you're doing whatever you can. You're changing your life. You're rearranging your schedule because you know what I did on the cross and you know what I'm going to do and you know I'm a God who keeps my promises. So you're going to be engaged. And so this is, this is what he does. He, he goes ahead and he, and he quotes. And in fact, what he does is he quotes a couple of different scriptures. And, and uh, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, so that it is written by the prophets. So here's where the magi, the, the, the wise men, come ahead and say this. And it says, it talks about, it says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by are by no means the least rulers of Judea. For uh, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Let me go ahead and let me break that down for you. So I don't know if you can see it or not. So what Matthew had gone ahead and done through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is he had gone ahead and he'd actually combined two different places in Scripture. He took the first part of it from Micah 5.2. And so you can see kind of, and then the second part, the last line, from 2 Samuel uh, 5.2. And so what you see is you see the first part, it says, And you, O Bethlehem, so he kind of repeats that, and it goes, In the land of Judah, what is he emphasizing when he's talking about the land, uh, the land of Judah? He's emphasizing the relationship to David and that he's a descendant of David. And in that he goes and he, he adds something else in, but he quotes the least among the rulers of Judea. But he adds in this, he says, by no means... So this area of Bethlehem is not very big. It's, not, it's, a, it's a small area... And understand it to be small, but Matthew goes ahead and emphasizes by no means in the sense that, yes, it is small, but listen up, pay attention. Something big is going to come out of Bethlehem. And, and so as, as the scribes and the Pharisees would have seen this and, and knowing God's word, they, they would know, all right. Um, as they read this later, they would go, okay. The, these are, this is changing. He's adding emphasis to this. 
And then it goes ahead and it says, from you shall come uh, forth uh, a ruler, or you shall come forth through me. And so what he's talking about is saying, Jesus is going to come. Who will shepherd my people Israel? And you see that coming from uh, 2 Samuel 5.2. You shall be my shepherd to my people of Israel, and you shall be in, uh, the prince over Israel. Pointing back to that, talking, all right, Saul was great. There's one coming better, uh, better than him. And, and be anticipating that, waiting for one who will be over his people, who will reign. Now, keep in mind that Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. And so he's appealing to them and their, and their knowledge of the scripture. But how is he bringing attention to this event? He's bringing his attention to this event by having Gentiles, probably not Christ followers, come from far off to fulfill part of Scripture, to declare, to behold the birth of the Savior. Because Jesus is not just for the Jews, but he's for the Jews and the Gentiles. He's for all people. And, and Matthew's just kind of going to weave this all, all throughout the book of Matthew that you see, even though he's writing to a Jewish audience, he's going to show them that they missed it. Don't miss it anymore. Know who Jesus is. Know that he is king. And so... With, with these individuals who should know something and they just go, oh yeah, here it is. There's no action. We see nothing happen from them. But what does Herod do? Verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. He was like, all right, I don't want this to get out, but come here. I want to find out when did this star appear? And he sent them to Bethany saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you find him, bring him to me that I may come and worship him. And I, So what do we get? We get King Herod going ahead and saying, All right, I want to worship the king. Does he really want to worship the king? Not one bit. What does he want to do? He wants to kill. He wants to ensure power upon his throne that won't be threatened. And he goes ahead and says, I'm in control. But really, is he really in control? If he can get individuals from the, uh, from the east to come west by putting a star... And there's been lots of talks and lots of debate about what this star was. Was it a comet? Was it this or was it that? Here's the best way probably to understand it. God had it happen. God specifically had a way of leading these men right to Jesus for a purpose of the proclamation of, yes, this is the king that is born to, the, to this people and to all people that the world would one day, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord because he is sovereign over all. He is ruling and reigning. And so what we see is, um, obviously that was a ploy. He didn't really want to do that. He, and you think about that, all right. Um, the, the wise men were a little bit wiser than, than uh, Herod. After listening to this, the king, uh, uh, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went went from them until it came resting over a place where the child was. Again, how that exactly happened, we're not given full details. Um, they just did that. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So seeing the star, what was the response? He could have just said one time, yeah, and they were excited. They had, they had joy. But he goes ahead and he gives three folds. He said that they were exceedingly with great joy coming to the house, uh, with great joy and going to the house, they saw a child with Mary. 
And they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures of offerings of gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So again, these are, these are big, they are lavish gifts. So it probably would indicate that um, this happened after the time of his dedication at the temple because you see kind of at the temple uh, they, were, they gave the gift of, of individuals that didn't have much money. And just because there are three gifts mentioned here, that doesn't mean that there were just three wise men. I mean, hey, I, I might give my wife three, four gifts for Christmas, that doesn't mean that there's three or four of me, okay? So um, I think through, through stories and other things, people just kind of go, all right, let's go ahead and do that. And culture just believes it, and they don't read the Bible, and then they wonder what people say when they say, no, it really doesn't say the number. And then, and it doesn't say that they're kings either. Um, and being warned in a dream, did not return to Herod and departed on their way on their own country uh, by another way. And so we see all of this. We see God's hand, God working. One of the things to take note about is as we see through all of this, the title King of the Jews is not mentioned again in the book of Matthew until the very end. And it's not mentioned until Matthew 27, 11. And it says in Matthew 27, 11, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. And then in Matthew uh, 27, 29, And twisting an, an, uh, together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed on his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail the king of the Jews! And then in, again it says this, it says, And over his head they put charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And all that you see in here, it's almost in a, in a, in a mocking sense going, All right, he says he is, but he truly is. That's the charge that they brought against him. And saying he was declaring to be God, and he was God. But knowing that this is to a Jewish audience and saying, all right, he's the king of the Jews. He's not only the king of the Jews. Yes, he is. But he is the king of all. And in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says this. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So this gospel isn't only a gospel for the Jews. It's a gospel for all people. And the call is to go forth and to make disciples of all nations. That God is not restricted to one people group. He's not restricted to anything. But we are called to respond not as, as those that know the word of God and don't respond to it. But those who know God's word and want to follow it knowing because Jesus died on the cross for us. That we may have life knowing that his call for each and every believer is to herald the good news. And that's what we see. That he will go to great lengths, whether it was people who didn't believe in him or people who believed in him, it didn't matter. God was going to set forth the star and proclaim that Jesus is king. Now, with that great news, you wouldn't just sit and go, all right, I'm just going to sit by idly and not do anything. Now, remember that story I was talking about at the very beginning of, uh, of the service. Uh, when I came up to the counter, there was apparently another guy with the last name of Trip. Trip, again, is not that common. What did I do? I said, here I am. I want to get on the plane. I said, and, and this is what I said. I said, again, I had, my, I had my suit for the wedding and everything. I'm like, 
I'll just walk through. I don't need any luggage. I, I'll, I'll leave it here. I'll just go. Whatever I can do to get on. And there's not that many fights leaving Coos Bay, Oregon. So what did they do? They said, we don't have time to check your bag. But just go ahead and put it on the conveyor belt for regular carry-on luggage. And they sent it through, and they just said, all right, that looks fine. I mean, I had liquids of all sorts and different things than that, but they just said, go ahead. So I, w I walked out onto the air, uh, tarmac, and I walked into the plane. There was one seat left. I sat in that one seat. Probably as soon as I sat down, the door came up. My heart was racing. And I made it. And I was excited because I was going to get married. And I was looking forward to that. I could not, I, I, I contained myself in the sense of being right there in that seat, not screaming, Yes, they let me on. I mean, my heart was racing through that whole flight. And then when I got to Portland and everything else, waiting for my other flight, I was so excited. This happened. I was able to make it. I didn't miss it. I didn't have to call Stephanie on the phone going, yeah, I think I'm not going to be able to make it to her wedding. And it was, praise God. I said, God, thank you for allowing this to happen. How much more should we praise God saying, thank you, God, for what you have done. Thank you for sending your son. I will go ahead. I will rejoice in you. It is important that we do not miss Jesus. Are you rejoicing exceedingly with great joy that the Lord has provided a way of salvation? That's the call in each and every one of us who knows Jesus. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that are in them. I pray that we would not read them and study them and know them, but yet have no change. I pray that we would declare who you are, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are greater than all others. Lord, help us work in our hearts that we would declare you until you come again. And then in heaven, we look forward to declaring how glorious you are with unceasing praise. It's in your name we do pray. Amen.